everyone, Gary Simon here, and welcome to the second lesson that's a part of the 100% free course on developing and deploying Ethereum smart contracts for beginners. Now, in the first lesson, we just did a very brief rundown about what a blockchain is and smart contracts along with decentralized apps. If you haven't watched that, just go back and watch that first before continuing on. All right, so what we're going to do now is step into the Remix IDE. Now, when it comes to the Remix IDE, it's browser-based, but you can also optionally install on your own machine if you want. We're not going to do that. We're just going to use the online version, which you can access at remix.ethereum.org. Now, I'm going to switch over to my browser, and this is what you're going to be presented with uh, by default. They kind of have just some boilerplate, like a sample ballot solidity file here. This is a smart contract. And before we get rid of this and start our own, I just wanted to kind of do a real quick outline of the interface. So on the left here, we have our files. None are here except for this default one. Uh, over here in the middle section, this is where we actually write our code in the editor. Down here, this is where the de debugging occurs. And over here, we have a bunch of different tabs. And the only ones that we're gonna mess with uh, just initially are the run and compile tabs. And so the one area I did want to uh, describe before we begin coding is the environment section and we can see we have by default the javascript vm uh, that's selected there's also two other ones so by default we want to leave it at the javascript vm or evm which is stands for ethereum virtual machine but we will be changing this later on in the course now the JavaScript EVM means that you will run and deploy your smart contracts locally. They are not live on the Ethereum blockchain. This is ideal when we're learning about the absolute basics because it's very quick and easy. Okay, so let's talk about smart contract basics here. So in the IDE, we have this sample contract. We don't want it. What we want instead is to create a new one and We'll name it Corsetro.sol for solidity. You can name it whatever you want, actually. So we'll hit OK. All right. So we're going to start off by writing the following code. We have in here pragma, solidity, and then the caret, and then the version of solidity. All right. So every, let me increase this just a bit and make sure you guys can see everything. So basically, every smart contract will start off by defining the version of Solidity up there in that format. All right, the next section, create a uh, contract, and we're going to name it Corsetro. All right, so it looks very similar to a JavaScript class. All right, so right now, we're not actually going to run any code uh, or, 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 or write anything. Instead... Right over here, we're gonna click on this create button. Okay, so a couple things happened. First, this little blip showed up as well as something occurred down here in the debugger. All right, so this means that the smart contract, yes, it's not very smart at this point, lives at an address. So we could see 0x692 here. Now, if we want to see more details, we simply click on details right here. All right, let me drag this up just a bit. All right, so there's uh, several things here to note, but most importantly, we have a contact address, which is noted right here. This is where the smart contract actually lives. No, again, it's not live right now on the Ethereum blockchain because right now we're simply working within this development JavaScript EVM. Also notice gas right here. All right, so gas is the name for the execution fee that senders of transactions, in our case, or senders of a smart contract transaction, will pay for veri verification. So there's actually quite a bit more. I, that probably sounded confusing if you've never heard of it before, but I basically it's the name of or for the execution fee that the senders of transactions need to pay for every operation made on an Ethereum blockchain. So the name gas is inspired by the view that this fee acts as a crypto fuel driving the motion of smart contracts. So gas is purchased from ether from miners that execute the code. Now you can read more about this and that was just a little excerpt from etherdocs.org which will dis 
uh, describe gas for you more specifically. All right. So let's go ahead and define a smart contract variable as well as a type. All right. So obviously the most simple concept in any language is a variable. Now, because Sol Solidity is statically typed, that is the type of the variables must be defined before compile time, then you must specify the type of the variable. So let's define a string variable in our contract. So we're gonna put in string. So we put the type first and then the name, we'll just name this F name equals, I'll just put my name, Gary. All right, so obviously very simple. Now there are other types of variables. So we have a Boolean variable, which is represented by B-O-O-L for bool. We also have an integer, an unsigned integer represented by I-N-T and U-I-N-T. Also we have address and the address type represents a 20 byte value. And that's meant to store an Ethereum address. And these address variables that are typed as address also have members, including balance and transfer. We'll see that later. Also, we have bytes one through 32, which are fixed size byte arrays. We also have bytes, which are for dynamic size byte arrays. We also have string, which is for a dynamically signed string. Mapping, and these are hash tables with key types and value types. And we're gonna look at that more in a later lesson. And then also struct, and struct allows you to define new types. Again, we're gonna go over that in a different lesson as well. Now, let's also define my age, all right? So no one can have a negative age, so we will use an unsigned integer for this. UINT, age equals 34. All right, so let's go ahead and hit create. We can see we have a new, a brand new contract that showed up beneath here. Now, at this point, if you look under details, for instance, it's not going to show you anything here in terms of my name or age. All right, so this is where public and private visibility comes into play. So Solidity has four types of visibility for both functions and variables. So first we have public, and this allows you to define functions or variables that can be called internally or through messages. We also have private. So private variables and functions are only available to the current contract and not derived contracts. We also have internal, and these are function and variables that can only be accessed internally or which is the current contract or derived contracts. And don't worry, when I talk about derived, you'll understand that later. And then also external. So functions that can be called from other contracts in transactions, but they can't be called internally except with this dot function name. All right, so let's add a public visibility to our variables. The way we do this, we simply put in public, public here. And let's go ahead and hit create. Ah, okay, so now we can see that we have two of these blue buttons down here. And these also represent the names of the variables. Now, when you define public state variables, the EVM creates getter functions for them. So you can actually click on these buttons and we'll see down here, we have uh, the debugger going here because these are separate calls. So. Again, it creates these functions as if you can just call them and it will return the value for you. Okay, so let's also talk about the smart con contract constructor. So every smart contract has a constructor function. So this constructor is called when a contract is created. So inside of it, you can define the values of variables and do other things. So for instance, if we wanna create a constructor function, which will execute when this contract is created. We simply define it by function and then always has to be the name of your contract, okay? So in our case, it's Corsetro. And then here, all right? So we'll see this little uh, error show up. This didn't used to show up or it's a warning rather. Uh, if you want that to go away, we have to define a visibility on the function. Okay, so now if we were to remove the actual values, we can define them here by saying f name equals Gary 
and age equals 34. All right, so if we hit create, we'll see it works exactly the same way. All right, let's also talk about constant variables. So variables can be declared as being constant in that they cannot be changed. So once you set them, you the, the EVM will error and you'll see it in the debug in such a way that will not let you try to update that value anymore. So let's transform the F name variable to a constant variable. So the way we'll do this is we now change this from public to constant and we have to set the value here. All right, so we could see we have this X right here and if we try to create it, it's going to error, it will not work. So what we'll do in order to fix that is get rid of that here. Now we can create it. And we'll see down here, it only just returns the age at this point. All right, so let's also talk now about setting variables. At this point, we've only established just defining variables manually, but let's see what it takes to actually set a variable. All right, so Let's integrate a potential user interaction where we can manually define through like a text field, the course instructor's name and age as we've been working with. Okay, to do this, we're going to make some adjustments. We're gonna make a string of F name and also a unsigned integer of age. Next, we don't need a constructor function right now at this point, so I'm gonna get rid of it. I'm gonna type in function set instructor and it's going to take in our two different parameters for a name and age so this will be string of f name and then unsigned integer of age inside of here we're going to bind f name to the url parameter that's passed in and also age to our age next we'll create this get instructor function. Now this is gonna be public. It's a constant and it returns a value of type string and of a type unsigned integer. All right, so now we're going to return our F name proper variable rather that was set up there and age. Okay, so now let's go ahead and hit create. And now we can see down here, we have this red area, which means we can actually input data. So this would simulate if you had a user interface, like on a website, for instance, a text field. So what we'll put in here is first, we need to specify any type of string value it has to be encased in quotes. So you can't just put Gary, for instance. So the first parameter is the name, Gary, or yours or whatever. And then the next is an integer of an age. So if we click on set instructor, we can see something happened over here. There was a state change because we updated these variables. So if we click on get instructor, there we go. Now says Gary and age 34. All right. So hopefully you were able to learn a lot there because I did go through quite a bit, but still things are really simple at this point, which is how they should be when you're learning something new. So in the next video, we're going to step outside of Solidity just for a bit so that we can actually connect this very smart contract right here to a web-based user interface where we will be able to call our two different functions.